Dawn Trail is on the horizon, and with it, a new decade-long story arc that seeks to fill the shoes left behind by the Hydaelyn and Zodiac saga. Today, I'll be focusing on what'll likely be the first major arc of the Dawn Trail expansion, the Rite of Succession, and the hunt for the fabled City of Gold. At the Tokyo Fan Fest, Yoshi P had this to say on the structure of the upcoming MSQ. There will be major story developments in both North and South Tyrrell that will change the story significantly. You can almost think of it as a two-part structure. Of course, the whole story overall is one unified story, but you may feel like it does have two distinct arcs when you play through it. Meaning Solution 9, Shaloni, and perhaps the yet-to-be-revealed Sixth Zone will play a prominent role in that second act. So, what do we know so far? And can we begin to piece together what secrets may await us on those distant shores? Our new journey begins with a call to adventure, as Aaronville introduces us to Wuklamut, who has come to petition our aid in triumphing in a rite of succession in her homeland to the far west, Tural. The throne is currently sat upon by Galul Jarjar, a two-headed mammal jar who just so happens to be her adoptive father. For 80 years, Tural has known peace under his rule from his seat of power to Leolal. In unifying the continent, he has earned the alias of Dawn Servant. Now in his old age, he seeks to surrender his throne to somebody who will continue on his legacy. Uklamat informs us that there are four competitors vying for the throne. Herself, her brother Kawana, who studied at the studium in Charlian, a third who must not be allowed to win as they would drag Tuliolal into war, and a fourth who have not yet been introduced to. We can hazard a guess as to who these two unnamed competitors are. In this poster, we can see Wuklamat and Kawana, as well as a Mamul Jar. I believe this Mamul Jar is not only the fourth contender, but yet another sibling of Wuklamat and Kawana's, given that his garb appears similar to that of both Wuklamat and Galul Jar Jar, as well as the fact that she does allude to there being another sibling when she refers to Kawana as her second oldest brother during our visit to the Etherfont. As for the Warmonger, I would stake my claim that this will be Buckle Jar Jar, a character revealed at the last live letter. Two-headed Mammal Jar are described as being blessed siblings which are groomed for leadership from the moment they are born. Upon reaching maturity, Two-headed Mammal Jar take command of a number of their single-headed kin and head out to form their own warbands. It's likely that Buckle Jar Jar leads a warband who shares his ambitions for conquering the lands to the east in the wake of Garlemald's fall, and would make him and his people a considerable threat to the lands we call home should he be allowed to take the throne. The Scions are confirmed to be divided between at least two of the participants. Wuklamat has the aid of the Warrior of Light, alongside Erinville, Kryle, Alase, and Alphano, whilst Thancred and Urianje have been petitioned by another, most likely Kawana, if we were to pay heed to their positioning on the poster and their potential connections via the studium. As to why these competitors seek out our aid in particular, it would seem it is due to the encouragement of Galul Jarjar, who insists the ruler must be able to navigate the intricacies of myriad cultures, and there's no better way to do that than work alongside others from across the world. Wuklamat and Erinville confirm that they have been close friends since childhood. Could he be another adopted sibling? During our introduction to Wuklamat, she does mention that ever since he was a child, he dreamed of finding the Golden City, but failed in his quest. Though he does present himself to be largely unbothered, she calls him out, saying, Despite your assertions, I know you haven't given up on the City of Gold. Which just so happens to be where, according to rumors, the contest ultimately leads. The Encyclopedia Eorzea III does elaborate on Erinville with the following. He is an accomplished scholar, far more knowledgeable than one might expect for a researcher of a mere 25 summers, which is perhaps why the Forum personally requested his services while preparing for the star's evacuation. Upon learning of these plans, he refused to abandon our world and its countless undiscovered wonders, electing instead to assist the Scions in their efforts to save Aetheris. He now works closely with the students of Baldesian, though despite his deepening relationships with curious sorts, None yet know what he was called before he departed his home and took the name Erinville. Abandoning his prior identity may have been done to hide his royal lineage, perhaps. Whatever the truth of it, Erinville's clearly driven by discovering hidden wonders, and what better wonder to discover than the fabled City of Gold? 
The City of Gold was hinted at as far back as Heavensward's Great Google Library. A book titled Over the Horizon mentions the existence of a bleeding City of Gold. The book itself referring to Melvib's own discovery and subsequent adventures upon Tyral, alongside her League of Lost Bastards. I wonder if she'll be making an appearance at some point during the expansion. Given how little we know of the City of Gold, it's hard to speculate using facts. We can look to the real world for what may well have been the inspiration behind the City of Gold, that being El Dorado and the myth of the Seven Cities of Gold, the latter of which may be more plausible given Emmett's description of the fabled golden cities of the new world. Despite the assertions that it is a single city, I'd imagine Emmett of all people might know the truth of it. In the real world myth, none of these cities were ever discovered. Dawn Trail may very well seek to make the same true of their golden cities, instead focusing on a journey before destination storyline. But I'm personally guessing these golden cities will be ruins of the giant's progenitors or remnants of the ancient civilization which flourished here millennia ago. We are told of a distant metropolis during our visit to Amarot. Given how far away Tyral is from the supposed location of Amarot, it could mean that distant metropolis was once on these very shores. We see during P11 that Amarot was golden, so it stands to reason the ancients here too had cities which shone gold the existence of which fell into myth over the millennia that followed the Sundering. For now, let's return to some more calculated speculation and take a look at this poster again. Seeing as those competing for Galul Jar Jar's throne appear beneath him, it stands to reason that the lady at the top not only isn't a participant, but presumably is above him in the hierarchy. We know of his alias as the Dawn Servant. Could she be a manifestation of the Dawn itself? I had begun to theorize as to whether or not she may be connected to FF11's Goddess of the Dawn, Altana, but given the fact that Hydlin already co-opted a lot of Altana's characterization, I highly doubt it. That being said, I do have one other theory for who this mystery character could be, and that is Valagarmanda. Valagarmanda was introduced in Final Fantasy VI as an Esper. Espers are humans who were transformed into magical beings by the gods of that world, the Roaring Triad the same three who served as the inspiration behind the bosses in Heavensward. These beings of immense magical power also possessed the ability to transform themselves into humanoids as a means to blend into societies in order to avoid detection. If Valagarmanda in Dawn Trail has inherited the traits of its predecessor, it's entirely possible that it may too have a humanoid form and act as a protector of Tyral or perhaps the fabled City of Gold itself. In researching for this video, I have stumbled upon other references to Valagarmanda, which has led me to an exciting discovery. Let's begin by taking a look at the Dawn Trail benchmark. The benchmark sees us and our allies facing off against Galul Jar Jar atop what appears to be a mountain somewhere in Okapacha. We can match up the locations to these screenshots and pieces of concept art. The scale of this place is befitting of giant kind and features motifs reminiscent of architecture we've seen in Tuliolal. This stone totem, visible for only a moment in the benchmark, is adorned with imagery evocative of Valagarmanda at the top. Interestingly, it is a very similar silhouette to that of Tuliolal's palace. Lower down on the totem are two faces, which appear to be carvings of the giants themselves, given the similarities between them and their supposed descendants, the Yokoi. It's important to remember Tuliolal as a nation-state has only existed for 80 years, which serves as the biggest piece of evidence in the theory that these are all relics and locations from the giant's empire. Was Tuliolal once a seat of power, with its temple built in reverence to Valagarmanda? It may well be this totem shows a hierarchy of sorts within the empire, with Valagarmanda at the top, senior giants beneath Valagarmanda, the Okoi beneath them, and whatever this eight tailed thing is at the bottom, which we'll come back to later. Elsewhere in the Dawn Trail benchmark, Kryle holds up this stone tablet, which features what seems to be a giant interacting with a young Mummel Jar, potentially hinting at a deeper connection existing between the Mummel Jar and the Giants of Eld. The tablet itself appears to be one of many. Maybe in our pursuit of the fabled City of Gold, we come to learn of how deep the bond between these two races goes. I'd wager there's some significance to the golden embellishments 
on these slates. The giant's empire once spanned the entirety of Yonkteral. What led to their downfall, I wonder? It may well have been the calamity of water, which occurred roughly 1600 years ago, but I'd wager it's something a bit more interesting. In the giant ruin we're climbing in the benchmark, purple growths and energy saturate the land, but taper off as we get higher and higher up the mountain. We do see some creatures boasting purple formations on their back, this crocodile behemoth which Estinian is dueling in the cinematic, as well as these birds visible in the backdrop of this Dawn Trail poster. It's a similar organic material to what we see in the dungeon from the benchmark. I'll quickly don my tinfoil and ponder the idea that this purple organic matter could be caused by something beneath Tural itself and has begun latching on to living organisms, altering them in some way. Going back to the stone totem from earlier, this eight-tailed creature is inscribed at the bottom. Could it be something imprisoned by the giants and potentially the cause of these purple growths? In our search for the City of Gold, it seems we'll be uncovering the secrets of not only the giant's empire, but the history of the Marble Jar, as well as how Valagarmanda became such a significant figure to both civilizations, thousands of years apart. On the topic of the City of Gold, there is someone we'll likely come to know a great deal more about in our gallivanting across Tural in search of its secrets. That person being Galif Baldesian. Towards the end of the Endwalker patch quests, Kryle opens a long sealed letter addressed to her adoptive grandfather, Galif. The letter written by none other than Galul Jarjar. Within, he commissions Galif to aid him in investigating Tural's legendary Golden City. As mentioned though, this letter is incredibly old, and Galif is unfortunately no longer with us after the events upon the Isle of Val. We know that Galif yearned to see the world, traveling alongside three companions to distant shores and beyond. It's highly likely that him and his companions at some point visited Tuliolal and became acquainted with Galul Jarjar and his people, though petitioning him to help uncover the City of Gold speaks more so to the relationship that likely formed between the pair as I don't think such a request would be made of just anybody. At this point, I'll go back to what I said earlier, that being the fact that this letter was supposedly written by Galul Jarjar, because that's not entirely correct. Wuklamat confirms it's his signature on the paper, and that he may well have dictated it to someone fluent in Eorzean, but she does also mention how everything else seems to be fraudulent, such as the use of a wax seal. The devs want us to question the letter's integrity, but why? Did Galul Jarjar send it secretly, hence the odd custom? Could it be a true forgery, duplicitous in its nature, trying to coax Galif to walk into a trap he thankfully avoided by having too much mail? There's certainly more here than meets the eye. Hopefully, Galul Jarjar can fill in the blanks. They also happen to share an altruistic trait in that they've readily and willingly incorporated orphaned children into their families. Whether this was something they'd both considered prior to meeting one another, or if one took a leaf out of the other's book, regardless, the parallels between Wuklamat and Kryl, both following in their adoptive father and grandfather's footsteps respectively, will be a joy to behold. Kryl has had a long-standing membership within the Scion's B team, so the opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into who she is and watch her get to adventure alongside us is going to be great. Speaking of the Scions, Alase, Alphano, Kryl, Urianje, and Thancred are already accounted for, Grahar is assured Kryl he will tend to the needs of the students of Baldesian whilst she's away. Estinian has, rather fortuitously, boarded the ship to the New World with no real plan, and Yishtola is seemingly unaccounted for. I do wonder if Tataru will be joining us. The shrewd businesswoman she is, I'd be surprised if she didn't relish the opportunity to sell her wares to a new market. If the CGI trailer is to be believed, both Grahar and Yishtola will eventually make their way over to the New World. I imagine Yishtola will come looking for answers as to how one might feasibly and reliably traverse between the reflections. Maybe she believes there are answers here that may benefit her pursuit of knowledge. As for Graha, maybe the allure of proved too much, and he's left the students in the care of Ejika. Jokes aside, the CGI trailers have misled us before, and I'm happy to go either way on this, as I'd love for there to be more screen time given to the newer characters. Though, if I did have to hazard a guess as to what brought Yishtola and Graha to Tural, I'd be willing to bet it's related to Solution 9, especially if the other Scions will have a prominent role to play within the Rite of Succession arc. 
Funny, isn't it, how the two scions who likely have the most interest in discovering a way to travel between the reflections may not have a starring role until Solution 9 is relevant. But that's a theory for another time. To close off this video, I want to urge you all to concoct theories of your own. I only started playing FF14 two years ago, the entire playthrough can be found over at my Twitch channel, and throughout my time playing it, I'd cook up theories and ideas as to where I thought the story was going. Some theories were completely and utterly wrong, others were surprisingly close to the truth. Most were somewhere in between, but in the process I gained a deeper appreciation for the game's story, its world, and its characters. Dawn Trail's about to send us off on another decade-long adventure. I'd say there's no better time than now to begin theorizing and getting excited for what's to come. If you'd like to see more videos like this, a like and a comment would go a long way. If there's enough interest, I'll begin working on a similar video for what promises to be an explosive second act of the Dawn Trail saga.